Welcome back everyone to Flashes of Insight. And in this section, we're having a team panel with participants from the discussion groups. So what is the key piece of feedback that came out of your group? What's the big insight that you've got into worshiping in this context of COVID-19? The, the language that we have in, in the sort of post-COVID liturgy, if you can call it that, because I'm not sure that we are post-COVID yet, uh, is still the language of the church. It's still very formal and it perhaps doesn't quite reflect the language of ordinary people. For instance, in our diocese, we've been told not to have the prayer of the faithful, which was the part of the mass where you would hear the, if you like, the authentic voice of the parish. Different parishioners would have written the prayers. You would have heard the names of people who had died, anniversaries and so on, that has gone. And there is a feeling among some people that it's become a little less inclusive. Um, people are glad to be back inside the churches, really glad, but that feeling of inclusivity through the language isn't as strong as it was. Another really strong thing that came through from a couple of people in our group was the um, that COVID, the COVID experience really made people value their community and they were more interested in talking more intimately perhaps when they got back to church with people and the other thing that came through very strongly was we don't want to be told when we get there that we're grievously sinful and need to be sorry we need to have a great big welcome mat out saying you are very welcome thank you for coming and um you're here because you know god you need god and god's welcoming you i think one of the questions that well, either Tom or you, Joe, gave us was, um, is the table a sacred place? And I think the answer to that question is um, a resounding yes. A lot happens around the table. Um, and I think we eat, we share our lives, we tell stories, we console the sad, we, we lift up people who are down, we, we laugh with those who are happy. There's a myriad of things that happen around the table and in that happening, I think we discover also that, that, that not just the table is a sacred space, but that we are sacred people at, um, in this sacred space that we, we gather at together as we eat and drink. I think my point was that um, for, uh, to really be in that celebration, it's about connecting and touching and feeling and tasting. So it's signs perceptible to the senses, but also the fact that for, in a country diocese, I'm the liturgy consultant for the Diocese of Townsville, which is a huge diocese. And many people, it's their, their regular experience not to be able to celebrate Eucharist, not just through COVID. And so it raises questions for me about how do we reach out across our diocese to create that community around a table that they can't partake in regularly. Okay, thank you. Um, so Carmel, coming to you. Oh, sorry, Kevin, did you want to add to that? Just one fascinating insight was that have we thought through technology and um, we're using it, but it was really interesting to say, you know, is there a theology of technology? Does it, does it, is it coherent with what we are and who we are? How do how we use it? And I think it's a massive question to be explored. But one of the things that one of our group members said that really struck me was he was talking about uh, watching three guys in a lounge room, three priests saying Mass. And he talked about the difference between being at Mass and being in Mass. <laughs> so actually being a participant. And that has drawn him not to watch Mass, but to actually then find, um, now I don't know whether I'm paraphrasing you Dave or I'm not doing the right thing, but my understanding was that he's come to use some liturgical expressions that are not necessarily the formalised liturgy of the church. The other thing that um, I have found is that there's been a sense of frustration I think from me because uh, we've got all this wonderful liturgical treasure that we're not even exploring and my fear is that we're going back to Mass as if nothing had happened, not even having lo losing or missing out on the opportunity of, of exploring other ways of, of being liturgical. But I think for many of us, it's as it was in the beginning. 
it's just going straight back to mass. We have the social distancing and all of that. But the really positive thing that I've learnt, and I think this is interesting from your point of view, Tom, you were talking about us needing to learn about a domestic church. I would say there are many parts in the world that have never lost that. Um, Fiji and the islands, they pray every day in the home. Um, and we had one group of students, seminarians, who went out with their host, Benji, and went into a home and the mother gets them up at 6 a.m. every morning to pray because this is what you do in, in Fiji. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing to talk about, but I think sometimes we can get caught up in our Western context. And I would imagine that island people in New Zealand and other parts of the world and lots of other people do pray regularly as domestic church. If we come back to the question of language, um, are we using the language of liturgy well in our domestic settings? Are we, are we tending to use ritualized language rather than sort of, I don't know, street language, ordinary stuff? Those of you who have done uh, worship at home, what language did you use? Did you go back to the, the Roman rite, if you like, and open it up and start from there, or did you make it up, or where did you go? One of the things I do is prepare a couple of liturgies of the word. So I call one formal and one family. Um, and it's a bit like what you said earlier you were doing, Joe, because I think you said you did one for kids, one for families, and one more formal. Um, the, the family one I go through, so I, I tend to start off with the formal one, and then I go through and then I put it in, I've been a teacher for a long time, I put it into language that I'm fairly confident that young children will be comfortable with and understand and be able to have a conversation about if they say to mum or dad, or well, what does that mean or what's that about? I can just uh, follow uh, on from what, what Judith just said. It was very interesting in our group. I don't think the, the word mass was used once in the course of our conversation. And the word Eucharist came up, and while we know that's you know, formal by implication. Um, the, the fact is it was, it was used in an adjectival way. Things were spoken of as Eucharistic. And I think that's highly desirable uh, from a personal point of view, but it equally reflects uh, a shift in emphasis. And perhaps you'd expect that in the wake of the talks that we've been hearing over the last number of weeks, the kind of words that, uh, that uh, Tom has been using, but it seemed to arise quite spontaneously in our in our discussion. That seemed to summarize other words that came up as as being of importance, such as sharing and kindness. And uh, these were words that had arisen in people's experience in the wake of COVID because of their their sort of importance in terms of how we relate to one another. But above all, Eucharistic as being uh, the word that we defaulted to in the course of our conversation. Could I just uh, question that slightly? I mean, I, the, the family table in our house is hugely important. And I agree that, there that the meals around the table resonate with Eucharist and they display the values that we have in Eucharist of Thanksgiving. But they're not actually Eucharistic, are they? Because they're not the memorial ritual of remembering Jesus and sharing the bread and wine and reading the scriptures. So I just raise that as a little question. I would think that they are very Eucharistic. To me, um, as a person who studied, uh, studied Eucharist a lot, um, I think that it, we're remembering. We're remembering stories. We're remembering family stories. We're sharing experiences. And Christ is there, very much part of that. Yeah, I would have to agree. Um, for me... Uh, not only is cooking my uh, my obsession when I'm not working, but um, in this time of lockdown, since working from home since the beginning of March, uh, I have found that um, I'm actually being more attentive to what I'm I'm doing in preparing meals and thinking about the significance of the meals. Also, while I share a meal with my husband, really missing the fact that our three kids can't come and see us because they're also in lockdown. So that whole attitude, all the things that Judith was talking about, that remembrance and 
um, and and that, that the attentive care in which things are prepared, the things that are given with love, the fact that we share our, our bodies and ourselves uh, in the meal, um, and the fact that during COVID time, I've had much more time to spend with my husband instead of rushing home from work, going off to chiropractors, doing that sort of thing. So for me, it's an attitude of, of, of thanksgiving and gratefulness that has become much more sharpened than it, than it has for many, many months. Thank yeah. you. Trudy, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, I just wondered, like, after that, that little conversation then, it's saying to me, you know, we talk about the Source and Summit, and Source and Summit means it's a journey. And, and uh, my understanding in sacramental theology, sacraments celebrate something that is. They kind of formalise what's already kind of happening and take it to a new dimension so is is the 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 table of the home you know part of that eucharistic journey towards the celebration of eucharist because the directory for masses with children in chapter one talks about the elements needed to lead children to the eucharistic table and those kind of things greetings sharing a meal are all part of a journey towards the culminating event. So to me, it's Eucharistic in the sense that it's always leading us to and from the culminating event of the Eucharistic celebration. I think in our parish, the fact that we have been physically separated for such a long time has meant that there is a Eucharistic element in the way that people come together before and after the actual liturgy. Um, people want to be together and it would be good if we saw this as a, a stepping stone towards mm -hmm. reflecting that perhaps more accurately in the formalised part of the liturgy. Um, the parish we belong to I think sees the liturgy as part of the whole greeting and post service mm -hmm. communication. Um, but it's about integrating it, I think. I do fear, though, that the language of the current translation we use at Mass is so formal, so divorced from the way people feel, we've almost de-skilled people from using language to pray in their own home because they don't think that's proper sacred language. Yeah. And someone in our group made that point quite powerfully, that most people pray just by saying, oh, God, and say what they want. Whereas when they're at church, they have to say it in a very different way. And I do fear, and I've contributed to this, I think, during the lockdown, that what we've provided for our parish is in very formal language and haven't encouraged enough saying, you know, when you sit at the table, the things you share together are part of your Eucharistic journey and the language you use is sacred language because that's the language we speak to each other and we meet Christ in that language. Uh, well, a couple of things really. Just in case you despair of England, um, our bishop insists that we put the bidding prayers back. Um, oh, precisely, yeah, precisely because we could name people. Um, and yeah. he said, you know, when else would you want to pray if not in COVID? But a couple of things have struck me. One was in our group, um, somebody mentioned it's true everywhere, I think. People, when they went to Mass uh, on Zoom or whatever, live stream, they often went back to a different place, perhaps to their own language group, um, to the, la the village they came from in Ireland, whatever it may be, because that's where they felt rooted or comfortable, um, rather than seeing a priest say mass in a place they couldn't go to. Um, and I think the other thing that I, I keep on raising in all of these discussions is what about the people who live alone? Um, what about the people who are on the edges? Um, and I think sometimes our discussion is very good and very beautiful about the people committed, but I often talk with the backbench people whom I don't know, whose names I don't know. And have we lost them um, in this experience? I, I wonder if that's a good segue into uh, a question really about where do you think each of you, the church is at at the moment? When you think about church, after the experience of COVID, what do you think? What what describes it and is it different from what it was at the beginning of the year radically different can i just say one thing presiding at mass last week which is the first time we've all had to wear masks was scary mm -hmm. it was looking at an anonymous crowd really um, mm. and then having 
I don't wear a mask or put a visor on to give communion. It, it's what's that saying about who we are? And yet we've got to do it. Obviously, it's it's this isn't an ecclesial thing, but it, what's that saying about our whole society walking up and down the street with everyone with masks on and if I could, if I could respond to that, I, I, I can't agree more. Really, I, I think the um, the relief. What will change in particular? I think is the, the what or what will change us? Perhaps I should say is the extreme relief we will feel when we start to encounter people uh, much more intimately again. In other words, when we can see the face, when we can shake the hand, when we can embrace, that will transform and perhaps cause us to reflect on what prior uh, to this moment we have always taken for granted. You know, that opportunity to, to be one quite literally again is something I think we can all look forward to. And it's not just a hope. It's something that we are palpable, you know, we have a palpable sense of uh, precisely because of what Kevin just said, that sense of, of distancing that, that exists, even though we've now been able to gather again, we have uh, barriers between us and looking forward to those barriers coming down may, and I look forward to them informing how we actually approach liturgy itself. But one of the things that, uh, really has struck me that a number of people I've spoken to are desperate to get back in their physical community, but still are incredibly anxious, so anxious, you know, despite the fact, even the fact that, you know, once we sort of don't have to wear masks, they're so afraid of touching people because we'll have gone so long with physical distancing. So that's my concern. While there's this desire to get back, there's going to be all this anxiety, particularly from people in the vulnerable age group. You know, and mum said, I'm happy if we don't ever have the sign of peace. And I didn't try to contradict her because she's in that place of fear at the moment. And I think there are quite a few people in that space. So I think it, it will take a vaccine or something like that to get us back slowly into that full physical mode again. One of the things that I've heard from our youth minister in the diocese is that the young people have loved being able to go online to see mass. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's more enlivening for them, they feel, than what they experience in their parishes. So it, it's going to take a lot to enable and encourage the youth to come back into a, mm. a, a liturgy that at the moment they do not find nourishing. And unless this COVID really changes the way we shape our liturgy and celebrate it with life, we're not going to get them back. Right, so our church is moving on. Are the people moving on? Is the institution moving on? Mm. Or is everybody just moving in different directions? Silence. Well, I've loved hearing all these conversations because I think the conversations we're having both here and online, all these kind of conversations are really, for me, challenging our ecclesiology and our Eucharistic theology and what we need to do. So I think it's exciting from that point of view. I, I agree entirely with Judy, what you just said, but I do fear that the institution of the church is going on somewhere else, yes. that we're having these conversations and there'll be ha these conversations going on in other forums in other places but the actual institution of the church they're still just wanting us all to go back to mass and do what we're told and look at the priests celebrating mass um, what, what i find a laugh is that we we wear masks in church and socially distanced and as soon as we're in the car park the masks are off um yeah. and, and they're passing away as if there wasn't anything happening in the world so i i know we've got to be, we've got to do what the, the government says in church but it's interesting as Tom says, the people do their own thing anyway. <laughs> and maybe we'll leave it on that note with Kevin. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Joe and Jared Shepherd there in the UK and uh, Sophie uh, over there in Australia and Judith up in Auckland and Judy also in Australia. And also to thank the panelists, Joe and Carmel, James and Kevin. Tom, last word is yours. It's just one sentence from Rudolf Bultmann. One must consider the high point of Christian life to have been the gathering of the community for worship. When the figure of Jesus, his teaching as well as his life, 
was set forth before the eyes of the faithful and when accordingly the Gospels served for public reading. You have been part of Flashes of Insight, Let's Talk Liturgy during COVID-19 with me, Joe Grayland, and Tom O'Loughlin, who's the Professor Emeritus of Historical Theology at the University of Nottingham. Thank you very much for being part of it. 